Well, thank you very much. So this session, uh, we're going to be hearing uh, more about the applications of quantum computers and what they will or, or perhaps what they should be used for. Um, so for now, I'm just going to say this. The quantum computer is the most powerful computing device that we can conceive of building based on the laws of physics as we know them today. So here I'm going to focus on the question of how they will be built. What materials are we going to use? And how is that going to ultimately influence what the quantum computer is able to achieve? First, let's take a minute to consider conventional computers, you know, mundane computers like the one that's running this presentation, uh, which is restricted to uh, processing uh, information in definite states, zeros and ones, and not exotic superpositions of both at the same time. We call these classical computers. These classical computers are made, as you know, uh, using silicon chips, each containing billions of transistors packed together in integrated circuits. Silicon is, has become synonymous with computing and technology. We've got uh, Silicon Valley in the US, more parochially here, Silicon Fen and Silicon Roundabout. But of course, silicon wasn't always the material for computing. We've used different ways to represent information in computing. And that method of representing information has profoundly affected what the computer is able to achieve. Let's consider uh, one of the very first uh, computing devices um, dating back to the Roman Empire, the astrolabe. Now, this wasn't a, a general purpose uh, computer, but it, its mechanical design could accurately predict the movement of celestial objects. In many ways, it could be seen as a predecessor to the smartphone. It was a consumer device uh, that could help the discerning and superstitious medieval user uh, accurately predict uh, when would be a good day for their annual bath. Uh, a few thousand uh, years later, uh, Charles Babbage uh, came up with a different type of application-specific uh, computer based, again, on, on, on gears. Um, this was the uh, difference engine. Uh, its application was to uh, tabulate values of logarithmic and trigonometric functions. And its design involved 25,000 moving parts and would have weighed four tons. Of course, in the end, only a small fraction of it was built that we see here. Babbage also came up with a design based on the same mechanical concept for a universal general purpose computer called the analytical engine. But that device was so complex, it never got off the drawing board. So we see this fundamental problem that we faced in encoding information with these mechanical gears. This was all very well for small scale calculators, but it was no way to build a large, uh, a large computer. For general purpose computers to, to really take off, we had to wait another 100 uh, years uh, for uh, Tommy Flowers to develop the first electronic computer. The Colossus was made in uh, the post office research station in Dollis Hill, uh, up the uh, Metropolitan Line from where we are now. And, and Colossus uh, contained about 1,500 vacuum tubes and really set the stage for two further decades of development of computers that use that way of encoding information. Uh, uh, subsequent generations of, of vacuum tube computers uh, added memory um, and became a bit more powerful, but the number of vacuum tubes in these computers didn't change very much. Again, there was this fundamental problem with scaling. So instead, you know, the real revolution in computing that's changed our society over the last 50 years was driven by the move to using silicon transistors and encoding information within the states of these transistors. The silicon integrated circuit went from a, a proof of principle concept in the late 1950s to the first commercial microcontroller in 1971. And this radically changed the way the computers worked and reduced their cost, their footprint, and their power consumption. So looking back at all of these different technologies, each of these, uh, each of these different approaches was the leading way to make a computer in its time. But the first two rapidly reached limits in scalability. Only this final approach, the silicon transistor, was able to demonstrate this remarkable million-fold increase in complexity from the thousands of transistors that were found in the first microprocessors in the 1970s to the tens of billions of transistors that we have in modern um, silicon chips. So to try to understand how this was possible and what the differences are between these, Let's look at the physical resource which is used to encode each piece of information in these different technologies. For the mechanical computers, we're talking about using vast sort of Avogadro number scale uh, uh, numbers of atoms 
um, to encode the information in the positions of gears. And in valve computers, it was billions of electrons that were used to encode information. But by moving to the silicon transistor, we set the stage for this remarkable advancement from using the states of millions of uh, electrons um, that was used in the first uh, microprocessors to what we have today where individual bits of information are stored using just 5,000 electrons. And we can, we can view this in, in, in one of two different ways. On the one hand, um, that's pretty impressive. It shows that the technology has advanced so far that we're using just a few thousand subatomic particles to encode information. That's a pretty remarkable harnessing of nature. But on the other hand, it tells us that we still have some way to go. Rolf Landauer famously said, information is physical. First of all, this means that there are thermodynamic limits to how much power computers will dissipate. Computers that are based on logic gates like NAND and NOR. They, these gates dissipate some power based on the change in entropy in going from two input states to one output state. But interestingly, despite all the decades of development that we've seen in modern computers, even the latest chips that just have a few thousands of electrons representing each bit of information, still dissipate power, which is about a million times more than this thermodynamic limit. Information is physical also tells us something else. It's telling us that when you change the way in which you represent the information, you change the physical means with which you encode it, then the information itself radically changes. Let's think about that for a minute. It, it, it's quite a strange idea. We're used to thinking about information as something abstract that can be separated from the physical way in which we encode it. But if we take information and we store it uh, and we represent it in the states of quantum systems like atoms or electrons and photons, then the nature of this information radically changes. It becomes inherently richer. We call this quantum information. It's inherently more secure because it can't be copied. And computers that are able to process quantum information can solve problems that are just intractable using even the fastest supercomputers today. So getting back to the question, how will quantum computers be made? Well, just like with classical computer, there's a plethora of options. After all, all uh, nature at its fundamental level obeys quantum mechanics, and so we can pick all manner of different quantum systems and identify states in which to represent information. But over the past uh, 25 or so years, various quantum physics experiments have been identified as uh, pro uh, providing a promising route towards developing practical quantum computers. I'll list a few of the most uh, currently most uh, uh, um, uh, tractable ones uh, at the moment. Um, they're based on encoding uh, quantum bits or qubits in the states of uh, superconducting um, circuits with carefully engineered nonlinearities, or using the internal states of atoms or ions that have been tracked, trapped in vacuum using electromagnetic fields, or encoding the quantum bits within the states of photons, single particles of light that are guided around waveguides or through free space. Now, each of these approaches involves advanced cooling technology, cooling down their chips to a few degrees above absolute zero or even colder in order to achieve optimal performance. So far, the most complex quantum computing uh, circuits have been achieved using these superconducting circuits, while the lowest error rates have been achieved using trapped ions. But none of these technologies yet has delivered a quantum computer that's able to solve useful problems better than classical computers that we have today. In principle, a quantum computer with just 100 quantum bits would be sufficient to begin solving useful problems. And we already have superconducting uh, 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 quantum processes that have achieved that level of complexity. The problem is that the error rates in these computers are still too large, and so the full quantum algorithm can't be run. In the short term, there are two solutions to this. First of all, uh, there can be improvements in the quantum algorithms to make them more efficient, which means they can run before the errors take over. Alternatively, the quantum hardware can be improved to reduce the error rate. And of course, we'll have to do both of those things. But these approaches together, um, if successful, will lead to uh, useful but ultimately specialized applications of quantum computers. Um, if you want the sort of quantum equivalent today of the uh, uh, planetary um, uh, trajectory predictor and, uh, and log table calculator. For the longer term, if we really want a true general purpose quantum computer the, of the world changing variety, then we need to find a way to implement quantum error correction 
in order to fundamentally suppress these errors. And this requires quantum computer chips with not hundreds, not thousands, but millions of qubits. Now, each of these approaches that we see here um, is, is likely with enough development to lead to uh, quantum computing devices which can begin to solve some kind of um, useful problem. But nobody really knows today which of these, if any, is capable of yielding a large-scale universal quantum computer. And this raises a really fascinating question, because undoubtedly quantum computing represents a revolution in our ability to compute. I mean, the quantum information is completely different to any kind of information we've processed before. But will this necessarily bring together, bring about another revolution in quantum computing hardware, just as we saw from uh, uh, gears to valves to silicon transistors? Or is it possible that the same silicon transistor chips that we use today could somehow evolve into quantum computers? Let's take a look at one of these, uh, one of these billion transistors that we find on modern um, silicon chips today. For the past 15 years or so, the minimum feature size in these transistors has been 50 nanometers or less. And the way they work when the transistor turns on, they accumulate a large puddle of electrons underneath their metallic gate. So far, not very quantum. But if you cool these chips down to very low temperatures, just a few degrees above absolute zero, and slowly turn on the transistor, it's possible to trap just a single electron underneath the gate of one of, these, uh, of one of these transistors. And you can individually load the electrons into the device one by one. So we already have a technology that could, in principle, go from using thousands of electrons to store information to using just single electrons. And moreover, it's possible to access the quantum states of these electrons in these devices. We can initialize, we can measure, we can manipulate the quantum states of these electrons in order to perform quantum algorithms. Proof of concept devices containing six quantum bits have been demonstrated using these electrons in silicon. And the error rates are comparable with the state of the art in many of the leading technologies. So I was asked to, to end with a uh, bold prediction. And I'll leave it to you to judge the boldness of this prediction, um, which is this. Quantum computers will be based on silicon transistors just like today's computers. Why do I say this? Well, first of all, consider the manufacturing technology. The technology used to make silicon chips today is the most advanced manufacturing technique that we have on the planet. You have silicon wafers, each containing trillions of transistors being forged in these you know, tens of billions of dollar cathedrals to technology. If you can make qubits on this platform, why would you make them any other way? Secondly, it's about density. Uh, you should be able to pack in more silicon qubits uh, into per, uh, uh, per u a square centimeter um, than most of the other um, leading approaches. And finally, any quantum computer will need to be closely interfaced with digital and analog electronics in order to control it and run it. And the best technology that we have for that is the silicon integrated circuit. So if you can build the qubits and the control electronics in the same process, you have unparalleled opportunities for integration. So some of you may think that this uh, claim is not um, bold enough. After all, uh, the silicon um, CMOS process has uh, overtaken incumbent technologies in all kinds of different areas, from digital cameras to portable storage media. Why should it not be the case that silicon will um, take over quantum computing as well? So instead, let me uh, uh, close with a, a somewhat bolder prediction, which is to say that in developing um, silicon quantum computers, we may find better ways to improve the classical computers that we have today based on silicon transistors. Richard Feynman famously said, there is plenty of room at the bottom. Of course, he was right. But when it comes to computing with electrons in silicon, maybe we still have a way to go before we reach the bottom.